Knowing that dead space causes a gap between this expired CO2 concentration and the arterial CO2 concentration, you can actually calculate what the dead space is if you get an ABG. So the formula for this would be that the ratio of your dead space ventilation to your total tidal volume is equal to your arterial CO2 minus your average expired CO2 over your arterial CO2. This is just telling you what fraction of the total possible partial pressure of CO2 that you could be expiring, um, that you actually are expiring. This will make more sense in a second. So let's take an example of a patient with a tidal volume of 500 mils. Um, we're going to say that their PaCO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury, which is normal, and uh, we've got this from an ABG. And we calculate their average expired CO2 to be 28 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and this is from the capnography. This is not your end tidal CO2, so it's not the concentration of CO2 at the end of your breath. It is the average of the CO2 that you breathe out through the entire breath. I'll explain capnography a little bit so this makes more sense. Let's take a patient here. They'll have an endotracheal tube in. This will have a sample line on it, which draws a little bit of air from this point in the circuit, so basically just at the end of the endotracheal tube, and it will tell you what the concentration or partial pressure of various gases is that passes this exact point. The amount of CO2 in the air of this person's airways and lungs will be the result of dead space. So up here near the top, where you have a lot of anatomic dead space from your trachea and your large airways, um, the concentration of CO2 will be zero. And then let's say just down at the bottom here, so the last air that you would breathe out is gonna be pretty close to whatever your PaCO2 is. Just a bit lower than that actually because of a little bit of alveolar dead space. And then in between, we'll have some mix. So our capnography shows us what's happening with the concentration of these gases as they're exhaled past this sample line. So we'll start our exhalation here. And this sample line will initially read zero because it's seeing this basically just anatomic dead space here. Then we breathe out more and the measured partial pressure of CO2 past the sample line will go up as we're starting to have this mixed gas past this sample line. So that's this part here. And then eventually we'll reach some type of plateau where it's basically just this alveolar gas down here that's finally passing your sample line. Then at the end of exhalation, we see a sharp drop of our CO2 being measured by our sample line because we are drawing fresh air in that has no CO2 in it. So this will go to zero when we inhale. The partial pressure of CO2 measured just before we inhale is called the end tidal CO2. And because we always have a little bit of alveolar dead space, this end tidal CO2 will never quite reach what our arterial CO2 concentration is. So let me actually change this to not be 40. Let's say it's 35 or something. It's a little bit lower than our arterial CO2. I'll just show that here as well. So let's say we have blood going through here and also perfusing most of these alveoli. Uh, it's just going to be this one here that does not have good perfusion. So we'll get equilibration of our CO2 to all of these alveoli, except for this guy, which will have zero. Um, so what we breathe out from all these will be the average of um, the CO2 concentration, which will be slightly less than 40. And in this example, it would be 33.33 millimeters of mercury. And this would probably be the end tidal CO2 concentration for this patient because this last little bit of air that you exhale will be coming um, from deep in the lung tissue from the alveoli whether they are participating in gas exchange or not. And then you get this gap between your arterial CO2 and your end tidal CO2. Okay, anyways, back to this equation. Um, we said that this is not the end tidal CO2, but actually the average 
CO2 from the time that you're exhaling. So you would actually need to figure out a way to calculate exactly what this point is. And I'm just going to tell you that in this example it's 28. So you'd have to look at sort of the average amount of CO2 you have during this entire period from exhalation starting to ending to get your average. This way the dead space you calculate accounts for the uh, dead space early in exhalation which is typically your anatomic dead space and then your uh, dead space later as you exhale which is typically your alveolar dead space. If it helps to think about it like this, the only reason that you're not getting a perfect box-shaped capnography is because early on you have anatomic dead space and then later on you have alveolar dead space. Otherwise, without that, the air that you breathe out first would be 40 and there'd be no mixed um, with dead space and non-dead space and everything would just be 40 across. So the the moment you begin to exhale, this sample line would pick up 40, but of course that is not the case because we have anatomic and alveolar dead space. Let's finish up this calculation. Um, so we said the PaCO2 is 40 minus the average expired CO2 being 28 divided by 40 is 0 0.3. So the ratio of the dead space to the tidal volume here is 0.3, or about a third of this person's breathing in and out is going to be dead space. So let's say that they have a tidal volume of 500 mils. That would show us that we have a dead space of 150. Beyond this being a pimpable math question, it's sort of useful to know the dead space because you now know that this patient's going to have serious problems if they're breathing with tidal volumes of only 150 mils. So you technically could use this equation. Uh, you just need to figure out how to get the average expired CO2. Um, the more valuable thing though is understanding the relationship between your capnography and your PaCO2 and using this simple approach, which is that your PaCO2 um, to end tidal CO2 gap should be less than five millimeters of mercury. So this between your PaCO2 and what you're actually seeing as an end tidal CO2 should be less than five millimeters of mercury in a normal patient. Remember this last part of your capnography is more reflective of your alveolar dead space, which is honestly what we're concerned about anyways because the anatomic dead space should be relatively fixed. It's increases or decreases of this alveolar dead space that we're really interested in. So when this is less than five, that's good. If it's more than five, that means you have increased alveolar dead space. So get a blood gas and compare your PaCO2 to your end tidal CO2. And then even without a blood gas, you can still just be alert for when your end tidal CO2 is much lower than you expect it to be. So say you're going along and then your end tidal CO2 drops to 20 from 40. There's nothing that does that really other than an acute increase in dead space ventilation or machine error. So be alert for dead space. If less than uh, expected and tidal CO2, the higher this gradient is. So the higher the difference between your PaCO2 and your end tidal CO2. So if this was down here instead, that means that you have dead space and that is because there's more dilution of the alveolar gas with CO2 free gas. So basically just gas coming from other places that didn't participate in gas exchange. Look at the difference in the expired CO2 concentration, or I guess this would be the end tidal CO2 concentration if we're looking at what's coming from the alveoli of this person who has just a little bit of alveolar dead space versus this person who has lots of alveolar dead space.